Good afternoon, everyone, and a very warm welcome to Are You OK Day? I'm coming to you from the Quest for Life Centre, and I'm delighted to see some faces that I know well. It's lovely to see you, Helena, particularly, uh, given we haven't seen each other for many years. And a warm welcome to Are You OK Day? What a great question. I'm coming to you from Gundungurra country in the Southern Highlands of New South Wales. And I'd like to pay my respects to the elders and the people who've cared for the country for tens of thousands of years. So on Are You OK Day, it's a great day to check in with ourselves and each other. And so often we're focused on meeting the needs of other people that sometimes we're so busy we don't even stop to reflect on, am I okay? And at Quest we often have this expression that we prefer to ask people, do you feel as good as you look? Which often means that you have a deeper conversation than just that superficial one where we often say to each other, I'm fine. And of course, we know that fine can stand for freaked out, insecure, neurotic and emotional. <laughs> and there are times, though, when we need to say to someone, I'm fine, thank you. But we do need to have people in our life that we can be real with. And that even when we're real with them about what's going on within us, that they still love us. And those connections can sometimes be quite difficult to find particularly if you're dealing with any major challenge in your life. Oftentimes, things like grief will change your address book. People will go out of your life because they simply don't know how to be with you in that state. Or they don't know what to say. Or people will often say, oh, you look well, which is really different from are you okay? Because if I say, oh, you look well, I'm pretty much making an assumption that how you look is how you feel, and I've already decided you're fine. So that's why that question, do you feel as good as you look, gives us the option to go into a more vulnerable place within us and to have a little bit more awareness around what is the truth of how I'm feeling right now. And I think sometimes people are loath to ask that question because they feel if the person says, I'm not so good, they won't know what to say. So I would encourage you to encourage you, give you the courage to ask the question. Because without those questions, people are living with their own isolated experience of anguish, of grief, of loss, of trauma, of despair, of depression, of anxiety, whatever their reality may be. So we can always start by saying, do you feel as good as you look? And if the answer is no, not so good, then we can help connect that person to some resources, some people, some services that may actually be of benefit to them. You don't have to have all the answers for that person. But if you are willing to ask the question and then be there to walk with them until you can find some services or an individual who can actually be of assistance to that person, then that's such a blessing in itself. You know, on Tuesday this week, uh, John Brogdon launched his first book, Profiles in Hope, where John had interviewed 15 prominent and not so prominent Australians who had all attempted suicide and survived or had contemplated suicide but hadn't attempted. To find out that inner world, and of course, for many people who do have a high profile in the community, uh, it's very challenging for them to be with that vulnerability within themselves and to know who to trust to let into that vulnerability as well. And there were so many beautiful stories that John has captured in Profiles in Hope of Lang Beachley, of James Packer, um, of Ian Thorpe, all of these people who look so successful and yet just like each one of us 
They have that very human condition where our inside doesn't always match either our outer accomplishments or our outer appearance. So that's the first great takeaway from today. Do you feel as good as you look? And I'd encourage you to ask yourself that as well. Because we often look in the mirror before we venture out for the day to make sure the hair's done, the lippies on, or whatever it is that we do before we leave the house for the day. So we attend to the physical body, but how often do we reflect on, am I living the life I came here to live? If not, why not? And what am I going to do about that? And those are wonderful questions that often only arise for each one of us when we're faced sometimes by some unexpected trauma or tragedy. It's often when the unthinkable, the unimaginable, the unexpected happens in our life that we're kind of blindsided by life and we have to reflect on who am I? Is this what I thought would happen in my life? If not, why not? And what am I going to do about this? So those moments of suffering are often our catalyst for the greatest growth within ourselves. And you've probably heard the term post-traumatic growth. And indeed, it's a real thing that all of us can achieve with support and with care and with education. And we really need that support and that care in our family, in our community, to enable us to be able to move through some of these mighty challenges that we know people face all too often. What we discovered at, at Quest many years ago is that happiness is really an inside job. It's not really dependent on the outer circumstances in our life. Um, I know we all tend to work so incredibly hard to accumulate the things that we think will bring us happiness, whether that's to, to buy a house, a better car, whatever it is that we aspire to. And we can spend a tremendous amount of time on the getting of stuff. And, and then, of course, we have to dust the stuff and then the stuff wears out. We need new stuff and we keep working to get this stuff. And then, of course, none of the cords from the old stuff fit the new stuff and vice versa until the whole planet is pretty much stuffed. And yet that's not where happiness lies. And for me, that was one of the great blessings out of nearly dying and then not from leukaemia when I was in my 30s that I knew, not, not believed, I knew happiness was not about the stuff. The last shirt has no pockets. We're not taking any of it with us. And what gave me joy uh, really was about the inner state. Was I at peace with myself? Was I at peace with my history? Was I at peace with the people that I shared my life with? And I came up short on all of those answers at that time. So it's often the unexpected, we call them at Quest, we call them the Ds in life, the drama, the disappointment, the disaster, the diagnosis, the death, the divorce, the despair, the disloyalty, the disagreement, the downpour, the drought, the death, the, oh, there's lots of them. And when that D happens in our life, everything that second nature to us doesn't work. It might be second nature to you to blame everyone else for your own unhappiness. It might be second nature to blame yourself for your own unhappiness. It might be second nature to you to withdraw into an old pattern of, I'll do it myself. It might be second nature to you to maybe have that extra glass or two or that we numb ourselves in some way with drugs or alcohol or busyness or sex or power or something to try and fill up that kind of inner void. Happiness is an inside job. And it's not until for some people that suffering happens that we begin that kind of return journey back home to not what is second nature to us, but what is our essential nature. It's interesting we call it second nature, 
because you'll often hear people say, oh, it's second nature for me to feel like this, to think like this, to react in this way. And no one ever considers, well, what's your first nature? What was there before you took on all of those beliefs, those judgments that you hold about yourself, about others, about life? And it's often not until we bump into one of those Ds in life that we begin to think about, oh, actually, am I living the life I came here to live or am I living my father's expectations or am I? did I go into that career because everyone in the family went into that career? Was it actually what I wanted to do or am I living out someone else's expectation or assumption? And maybe I'm not willing to do that anymore. So for me, when we bump into one of those Ds in life, which are never fun, you know, the drama, the disappointment, disaster, diagnosis, death, divorce, then none of them are ever fun. But don't we learn more through those experiences than we do on a fine sunny day? So why it's so important for us to reach out to one another is that we don't know what D another human being might be living with or they may have several Ds going on. And if we make that assumption of, oh, you look well, it's kind of a complete and utter dismissal of the inner being that's having a very different experience than how that person might appear. We found that happiness being an inside job consists of these four components to happiness. And for me, these are both the definition of peace. They're also the definition of resilience, happiness. And I began to see these particular qualities in people when I began uh, working with people with cancer and HIV and AIDS and other life-threatening illnesses back in the early 80s. And I saw that some of these people just didn't die on time. If they'd been given a time by their doctor, you've got three to six, six to 12, 12 to 18. Doctors only work in these quarterly installments because they're talking about a statistical group of people. They're never talking about the individual because they don't know where you might fit. So what I began to see in some of these people was that they had some characteristics and they'd found how to be happy in the midst. Well, happy might be a little bit of a stretch, but they found peace in the midst of those Ds that I mentioned, divorce, death, diagnosis, disaster, downpour, drought. And so, interestingly, when they found those qualities themselves, it often improved their physical health as well. And indeed, last year I went to the funeral of a 96-year-old woman who was given three months to live back in 1985 and uh, with advanced stage bowel cancer, fourth stage bowel cancer. And uh, she was one of the ones who put these qualities into practice. And as I said, she died very peacefully last year at 96. So the first of these is we want to move from feeling a victim of life to feeling that we're in an empowered position to respond to life and its challenges. So these are known as the four C's because they each begin with the letter C. So the first one is we want to regain control over our response to life. This recognises we know perfectly appalling, dreadful, horrible things happen to really gorgeous, lovely, fabulous people. And it's fine to go through, why me? It's not fair. I don't deserve this. But if we want peace, we have to get past that. We have to accept that this thing, this D, this drama, disappointment, disaster, diagnosis, death, divorce, whatever it is, this happened. And we might have to weep about it, rail about it, scream about it, write about it, talk about it until we can say, yeah, that happened and it happened to me. And given I'm a woman, a man in this circumstance, what's an appropriate response, not a reaction? A reaction is from feeling a victim. A response 
is feeling empowered to respond appropriately to this challenge. A reaction is, this isn't fair, it shouldn't be happening, I don't deserve this, uh, which is understandable. We all need to go through that bit, but then we need to get past that. This did happen and it happened to me. And given I'm a woman in this circumstance, what's an appropriate response? You see, a reaction is always in the body. If you think about a time when you were seriously reacting to someone or something or something they said, and if I were to ask you, where do you feel that in your body? You'd tell me it's in the microbiome. Your, your gut might feel like it's turning. Your heart rate might feel like it's increasing. Your breathing might become more shallow. You might tense your jaw, your neck. You might hold tension in one shoulder. It's a reactivation of a physiology that we've experienced previously that we live again in the present moment. A response takes us into new territory. A reaction repeats what we've done before. A reaction is automatic. A response takes us into new territory. When we ask people, how old do you feel when you're in the middle of one of those reactions? And most people say somewhere between two and seven. And what we're literally doing is reactivating the physiology of the two to seven year old. But we don't want to speak from that and we don't want to act from that because that's when we say and do things that we later regret because you're really bringing a little kid to the circumstance. So you might need to practice getting yourselves out of sticky situations so that you don't just react as if you feel a victim in the circumstance. You want to be able to respond, not react. And so your job is to know where do you react in your body? Is it in your microbiome? Is it in the heart rate? Is it in your throat? Does your jaw tense up? So that you know that about yourself. And as soon as you feel it, it's like, oh, there it is. There's a reactivation. I don't want to speak from this. I don't want to act from this. So maybe I need to say, look, right now I feel a bit upset about having this conversation. I'd like to revisit it tomorrow. And I'd like a third person present. Or I'd like to go to the bathroom. The bathroom's always a great escape. And maybe you go to the bathroom, you just come to your senses, you bring yourself into the present moment. And we'll talk a little bit more about that shortly. So that you can be in that conversation in a more skillful way and not reverting to that more scared, perhaps, part of yourself that feels a bit anxious about the conversation. So regain control over your response to life. That's recognising this is planet Earth, this is where it all happens. If you didn't want suffering, wrong planet. This is where human suffering is in our face. And it comes at us through the television, through our devices. It comes at us 24-7 if we allow it to. So we may need to be really mindful about how much we expose ourselves to the suffering in the world over which we have absolutely no control. Focus on what you do have control over, not on what you don't have any control on. So the first C is we need to regain control over our response to life. The second C is a commitment to living where we have a deep reverence for our life. For me, the opposite of birth is death, not life. I've been with many people when they die and it's really obvious someone leaves. So for me, the opposite of death is birth, not life. Life is eternal. Love never dies. So this second C, a commitment to living, it shows up in how are you spending your time and what are your priorities in life? And I'd suggest that these are your only priorities between now and death. You are not your body, but you do have one. You need to nourish it appropriately. We encourage people to eat slow, seasonal, local, organic 
whole food. That's what human beings have been eating for tens of thousands of years. And it's only in my lifetime that we've changed our food supply so dramatically. And I believe a lot of our chronic disease is due to that. So seasonal, local, organic, whole food. We need to rest the body. Everyone needs somewhere between seven and nine hours sleep at night. And if you're not sleeping so well, then maybe that's something that you can take on because lack of sleep is showing up not to be a consequence of disease, actually to be a cause of disease. So it's important that we get good sleeping habits. And there are quite a few uh, resources on our website at questforlife.org.au about sleeping, about all kinds of things that can be helpful. So you're not your body, you've got one, you need to nourish it, you need to rest it, you need to exercise it, because it's a whole system of pumps. And if we're too sedentary, all of that slows down. So find exercise that you enjoy doing. You're not your brain, you have a brain. And the brain makes a wonderful servant and a shocker of a master. So make sure that your brain is in your service, not running the show. And that takes practice. You see, there are two systems in the brain. There's the default system, which was programmed in our early life. And then there's the neocortex, the executive functioning brain. And when those two systems are unable to work compatibly, one is in operation or the other is in operation. So the default mode is the little voice in your head that talks to you incessantly throughout the day, that projects into the future all the things that might happen, could happen, probably won't happen, or it goes into the past where it regrets, it blames, it shames about things from the past. So that's the default mode network. It's a bit of a dog's breakfast for a lot of people. And we definitely need to be boss of it because we've all had the experience when it's running rampant and we can't switch it off. But this other part of the brain, the task positive network, when you're in the present moment, then you have access to insight, intuition, wisdom, humor, spontaneity, creativity, and compassion. Those are the qualities of your first nature, not what has become second nature to you. Now, that's just a shift that a lot of human beings make in their life and often because of suffering they move from their default to that task positive network and that's also where you find happiness. So priorities are to quieten down your brain on a daily basis, keep yourself in good company, don't hang out with turkeys, don't hang out with gossip, be in company that uplifts, encourages, inspires you that's not just people, it's movies and books and television and environments you go into. And be in company that uplifts you. Environment is so much more powerful than willpower. So have a, a supportive environment around yourself. You're not your thoughts, you have thoughts, you're not your feelings, you have feelings, which of course begs the question, well, who am I? And that's probably another day rather than today. The second aspect of the second C are issues around communication because so many of us are not in communion with ourselves, nor do we have the capacity to communicate skillfully to others. So that's a lifelong journey to become a skilled communicator. And even when you think you're a fabulous communicator, you'll still be misunderstood, misconstrued, misinterpreted. So that's a lifelong journey to become a skillful communicator. We're human and we're all going to make wrong assumptions, expectations and so on. The third aspect of the second C are issues around forgiveness. Uh, that's a five day workshop for most people. Forgiveness is never about condoning. It's not about saying what happened was okay. It was definitely not okay, but it did happen. And we don't want to live the rest of our lives through the wounds of any past experience. We may need to weep about it, rail about it, scream about it, write about it, talk about it until we can say, yeah, that happened. And I've gleaned the wisdom from that experience, but I'm no longer living with the wounds of it. 
I'm no longer reacting as if still carrying any wounds from that past. Isn't that a liberation? It's not dependent on the person or the company or the government recognising that they wounded you and they felt sorry about that and came to apologise because if you're waiting for that, you might wait too long and your peace of mind is priceless. <clears throat> you don't want your peace of mind to be dependent on other people's actions. So we can do that inner work where we process the emotions around feeling wounded by whatever it was that happened so that we get to have a story, but we're no longer living and reacting from that story. I wouldn't change anything in my story now, and it's included a great deal of grief and anguish and physical pain and chronic pain, all kinds of things that I wouldn't wish on anyone, but I wouldn't change them. <clears throat> excuse me, either, because uh, we wouldn't be here today if all of those things hadn't have happened. And how can we be grateful for who we are now unless we take on board the journey that brought us here? So it's never about saying that those dreadful, horrible, illegal, perhaps violent, perhaps things that were completely out of control, we're not saying it was okay that they happened. It was not okay, but they did happen. And given they happen, how are we going to make peace with ourselves, with our history, given that? And perhaps to forgive ourselves is one of, one of the greatest challenges. That was certainly the greatest challenge for me. Um, so the third C is about challenges. You see, we love challenges. We love setting out to get that degree or climb that mountain or achieve something in our life. It's when our challenges are overwhelming and we can't make any meaning out of them, that's when we really suffer. That's when, remember, the pearl comes about in the oyster because something irritated the heck out of the oyster. So that's where we learn most about ourselves. When the unexpected, the unthinkable, the unimaginable happens in our life and it pushes us into parts of ourselves we would never willingly go and explore. But it also helps us to know ourselves in our depths and be comfortable around other people who may be also suffering. Because we it's never appropriate to say, I know exactly how you feel. You don't know how the other person feels. You might know what that place of despair, that place of anguish, that place of abandonment, rejection, anxiety feels for you. And it makes you a better companion to be with other people who may be also feeling that way and be perhaps new to the territory. So we're going to have to find a way of making meaning out of our suffering. And it doesn't have to be anything grand. It's in the tiny details of our life. So it's not about the big sweeps. It's not about the major decisions. It's in how we show up for a conversation where we deeply listen to the other person. Or maybe we give someone our time. Or maybe it's in the way we raise a child or plant a garden or smile at a stranger. It's in those little moments when we see each other and are present to one another that are so precious in life. So how are we going to make meaning out of our suffering? And then, of course, we need to be mindful with whom we share our pearls. You don't put your pearls before swine. That just means don't share your tender vulnerabilities, your, your heartaches with people that you don't trust. Only share those tender parts of yourself with people who you know will honour and respect them and not use them as a weapon against you at a later time or mock them or trivialise them in some way. Our fourth C is our sense of connection, connection to our essential nature, connection to our mates, our loved ones, people that we can be real with, and even when we're real with them, they still love us. It can be connection to country, to the seasons, to nature, 
to the divine, to cosmos. But we have our sense of place and belonging on the planet. Now, if we look at the opposite of those four C's, imagine the person who feels completely out of control with their life. They can only helplessly react to everything that happens to them as if they're a victim of their circumstance. Their commitment to living is, I'll be happy at a later time when things have changed and gone away, all the pain has gone away. They don't take good care of their physical, mental, emotional or spiritual well-being. A lot of people don't even create any time even for themselves to be with themselves. They don't look after their brain, the company that they keep. They're not in communion with themselves and they have no capacity to communicate skillfully to others. They're not in any sense of communion or peace with themselves. They have no capacity to forgive and they keep blaming what happened in the past and use that as an excuse for their behaviour in the present. All their challenges are overwhelming and they have no sense of peace from what's happened and they feel completely disconnected from themselves, from other people, from nature, from the cosmos, from creation. I think that's a great way of looking at the opposite of peace of mind and that peace of mind recognises there's much we can do very little about on the planet. But what we can do is manage our journey skillfully and that means by taking responsibility for how we conduct this journey. And those four C's, imagine if we lived, and I certainly endeavour to do, that no matter how critical, chaotic, confusing, upsetting things might be out there, that we can respond moment by moment to our challenges with a quiet mind, free of chaos, and an open and compassionate heart. We can do that because we've already taken good care of our physical, mental, emotional and spiritual well-being. We're in clear communication with ourselves and with others, have the capacity to forgive and allow things to be part of our story rather than something that continues to cause us any issue in the present moment. Thank you and that we feel that deep sense of connection to ourselves, to others, to our loved ones, to our community, to the cosmos, to the planet. You see, if we really understand that we're all born of the same consciousness, each individuated expression of this vast consciousness that enlivens all of creation, for me that's... Quantum physics, we know that even those things that appear solid, that if we penetrate down and down and down, all we're going to find is space and little packets of energy, and that's what we are too. And you appear to be on the screen and I appear to be down here in Bundanoon via the screen, but we're all born of the same substance. And yet so many of us feel isolated and alone with our thoughts so many of us grew up in households in which there was very little emotional literacy. No one actually taught us uh, even to label our feelings, let alone express them in ways that are healthy. I don't know, maybe you grew up in a house where uh, you had a lot of emotional literacy, but in the generation that I grew up in and maybe in the culture that I grew up in, we didn't ever talk about feelings. They were kind of like too hard to deal with and I avoided them like the plague. And my playground was my mind. That's where I derived a lot of my satisfaction from was using my brain, using um, my intellect in things rather than being an emotional human being. And I kept all of those emotions 
And, you know, there had been a lot of trauma, both in my childhood, a lot in my teen years, and after that too. And so it wasn't for me until I really hit the wall uh, when I was diagnosed with leukaemia, which came just after I'd separated from my husband, which came just after the suicide of my brother, uh, that everything for me came unstuck. And in our family, we didn't do weeping. We did stoicism. And we never talked about feelings because no one had a language for those. We talked about opinions, about beliefs, about things about other people, but we didn't talk about how we felt about anything. And it wasn't until I was confronted with my mortality and the certainty of my death, which clearly was actually uncertain, but I, for me it was very, it felt very certain and I, I absolutely prepared to die. I wanted peace before I died. It wasn't about... Uh, I want a cure at all costs. I just wanted to be at peace because I was not at peace with myself, not with my history, not with the people in my life, certainly not with many of the events in my life. And so sometimes these Ds, when they happen in our life, provide us with an opportunity of reviewing, who am I? What am I doing on the planet? Am I living the life I came here to live? If not, why not? And what am I going to do about that? And it always touches me so deeply that people travel from around Australia to sit in the circle here at the Quest for Life Centre with a bunch of other people who likewise have suffered some trauma in their life, the trauma of physical illness, chronic pain, the trauma of depression, anxiety, a diagnosis of mental illness, the trauma of professional exposure to multiple traumas. So it just touches me, it warms my heart so deeply that people trust us enough to travel so far just to find a safe place in which they can utter the unutterable and have it received and heard by others who don't try and fix them, don't try and make it better, don't judge them, don't do any of those things, but who get it, who hear that suffering. So Are You OK Day is the one day we take in a year, but it really needs to be a daily practice, that we check in with ourselves, that we check in with each other, so that ultimately in the future people won't have to travel halfway across the country to find a safe place in which they can share their suffering and know that they will not be judged and that they will be assisted. And that's the kind of world I want to work towards having. And at the moment that's not often a safe place for people. The workplace is often not a safe place in which people can have these deeper conversations. So I really commend those uh, businesses. I can see Group DLA there and some other people, individuals there um, who are online with us today who care enough about each other to want to even think about how could we work together more effectively and by being a little bit more real with each other real with ourselves by checking in with ourselves and real with each other. One of the sessions that we have, <clears throat> excuse me, on our program at Quest, when we get people into groups of three and we get them to do a brain dump of what are all of the activities that you engage in, what are the things that happen to your body, what are the things that you do when you're at the end of your tether? And anyone who'd like these lists, please just send us an email and we'll um, email them back to you. And so we have these lists of all of the things that people generally come up with when they're at the end of their tether. They've, they're more intolerant. They're more impatient. They don't sleep so well. Maybe they go off their food or maybe they overeat. Maybe they sleep all the time or they can't get to sleep. Maybe they implode, maybe they explode. 
maybe they blame everyone else for their unhappiness. Maybe they have a little drink or two too many. So these things that we use as kind of ways of comforting ourselves or soothing ourselves that may not be quite as skillful as some others that we could choose. And so I'd suggest that you write up your half dozen favourite ways of manifesting stress so that you know that about yourself. So what are the things that I begin to do? Do I get irritable? Do I withdraw? Do I blame everyone? Do I drive too fast? Do I drive aggressively? What, what do I do when I'm at the end of my tether? And we need to be really clear about those behaviours so that we take responsibility for them because they could be creating a little bit of habit for other people as well. So if we're really clear, okay, these are my symptoms of stress, then we get people back into the same little groups of three and this time we get them to focus on what are the things that replenish you? What are the activities, the environments, the things that you do or that you have in your life that give you back a sense of peace, a sense of connection to yourself? Well, in that list, that looks really different from the other one because on that list up comes nature, watching the sunset, sunrise, going for a walk, going for a run, a surf, playing golf, company of my grandchildren. The children don't come up quite as much as the grandchildren, I must say. Uh, having a couple with the girls, um, having a, a, a weekend away with the boys, um, meditation prayer, ritual, sailing. When you look at these two lists, the end of the tether one, with all of these I get isolated, withdrawn, irritable, grumpy, intolerant, my memory's no good, I get clumsy, forgetful, all of that stuff. When we're feeling like that, we're not in the present moment. These are the symptoms of when you have a backlog of emotional processing that you haven't done about something. And when you look at the list of these are the activities, the environments, the things that I do or have in my life where I feel a sense of connection with myself, those are all present time activities. You know, when you're riding that wave, when you're about to tee off at golf, you're not thinking in those moments, you're not thinking, oh, gosh, I forgot to take the chook out of the freezer this morning. You're in the present moment. You're right there, you, the board, the wave, you, the club, the tee, the golf ball. You're in the present moment. You know where Pinky is in those moments. We've just witnessed the Olympic Games and the Paralympics. Those people have cultivated being present to whatever the sport, whatever the activity is, so that we know that things become second nature to us after we've practised them 10,000 times. We know that from sport. Do that swing 10,000 times and you will have a neuronal pathway system in the brain that means you can do that action automatically. And didn't we all practise in our childhood doing being a particular way within our family dynamics? 10,000 times, 10,000 times. We might have become the quiet one, the responsible one, the athletic one, the bright one, the funny one. And then we develop that persona, but it may not be the truth of who we are in our essence. It may have been something we adapted to in some households as a survival mechanism and in others for other reasons. So if we look at that second list, all of those activities, surfing, meditation, ritual, prayer, singing, dancing, candlelight, firelight, a good conversation, eating a healthy meal, they're all present time activities. So one list is when we've got an emotional backlog that we haven't dealt with, the other list brings us into the present moment. Now, there are 168 hours in the week. 
We checked it out internationally. Everybody gets 168 hours every week. And every single one of them belongs to you. And you want to give every one of those 168 hours with a willing heart. You don't want to resent a moment that you give to another person or a situation. You want to give your time, because it's appropriate, you want to give your time and turn up 100%. So I'm suggesting that you divvy up your 168 hours that the first lot are dedicated to you, to nourishing your body, resting your body, exercising your body, quietening down your brain, keeping it in good company. If you do those things, if you isolate those half dozen things on that second list, the things that bring you into the present moment, might be soaking in a bath, it can be simple things, simple things. Nearly always they are simple things. And a lot of them are sensory things, you know, things we're tasting, hearing, seeing, feeling, the sen tactile sensations, massage. So it's a very sensory, because your body's always in the present. It's never in the future. It's never in the past. So use your body to ground yourself to the present moment, to keep your TPN, your task positive network, online so that you don't revert to a neuronal pathway system that comes out of the past, except in the situations where obviously you want to be able to drive the car but do you remember the first day you sat behind the wheel of a car do you remember how every little movement was so consequential not now because now you've got this beautiful network in your brain that enables you to do all of those activities read the environment on automatic, but we don't want to be entirely on automatic because we might miss the tennis ball or the child that's about to run across the road. So divvy up your 168 hours so that you replenish yourself first. Physically, exercise, rest, nutrition. Mentally, keep yourself in good company. Quieten down that busy brain. Be boss of your brain. Don't let it run the show. It's a shocker of a master. Fabulous servant. So keep your brain in good shape. Keep yourself in good company. And learn to ride this roller coaster of life more skillfully. Now, the fact is, Planet Earth is a bit like being on a roller coaster. You don't know what's over the crest. You don't know what's around the corner. And surely the last four years have taught us well that we don't know what's over the crest or around the corner. But it is your job to find and fasten your own seatbelt. Now, some of us love roller coasters. I'm in the front caboose. I'm signed up. Love them. Some of you, I suspect, don't even want to get on the roller coaster. But if you had to get on the roller coaster, I bet you'd fasten the seatbelt. And yet here on planet Earth, we don't even think that we need a seatbelt. And the seatbelt is the sure knowledge of how to care for yourself, physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually. Divvy up the first lot of your 168 hours a week so you've replenished yourself on all fronts. And then you bring your well-replenished self to the challenge, the chaos, the confusion, the crisis. I know it makes common sense, really, doesn't it? It's just that common sense is now so rare. I keep waiting for them to say when I fly on an aeroplane, we want you to run around the plane when the masks come down, run around the plane and put as many masks on as many people as you can before you collapse. But up until now, they haven't said that. They've said, first, put the mask on you. And when you're breathing normally, put it on the kids, put it on the other passengers. And yet so often in life, we're busy putting masks on other people and we're doing it at the expense of looking after ourselves. So it's good to be in service to life. 
In fact, that's where real happiness is found, when we make a contribution to life. That's where you'll find happiness. And, and again, it's not in the grand sweeps. It's in how we raise a child, plant a garden, make dinner, do our work. So we want to turn up 100% and give of our best so that 50 years from now or longer for hopefully for some of you and, and perhaps not so long for me, we want to be on our deathbed and be able to look back and say, Lord sakes, that was colourful. That was a ripper. That was a good life, well lived. But in order to do that, we have to actually take responsibility, our ability to respond to the challenges that we have, to the bodies that we have, to the circumstances that we have, so that we can skillfully find our way through with peace as our goal. So Are You OK Day is a great day to check in with one another. It's also a great day to check in with yourself. And rather than waiting for a D to come along in your life, waiting for something to cause you so much suffering that you finally <clears throat> get yourself to that place where you say, that's it. Something has to change and it's me. I can't change what happened. I can't change my childhood. I can't change my parents. I can't change the traumas, the tragedies, the unexpected, unthinkable things that happened. The only power I have, and it's a mighty, mighty power, is the power to choose my attitude, the power to choose how I see that circumstance, and the power to choose my response to that now in my life. That might not sound like a great power, but indeed it is, because then happiness is an inside job. And that you begin to recognise things are not happening so much to you, but for you. And that maybe the unexpected, unthinkable, unimaginable things that might happen in your life are actually the very things that will break you open to that deeper journey of peace, of authenticity, of sincerity, of compassion, where you actually live the life you came here to live, that you make the contribution that you came here to make. So I'd love to see Are You OK Day pretty much 365 days a year, that we have that level of concern and care for ourselves, for our family, our friends, our colleagues, the people that we share so much of our life with in the workplace and that oftentimes uh, in, depending on the organisation, we don't want a culture where you have to park your personal life at the door and just be a commodity that turns up to do the job that's required of you. We want the whole person to come to work. We want to care for one another and build loyalty amongst one another because that's born out of a genuine care and concern that each one of us gets to flourish in our life. 99.9% .9 of humanity want just to live a happy life and they want that for everyone else as well. It's only a very small, tiny percentage that thrives on war and conflict and power and manipulation and upset. The rest of us want to work collaboratively, cooperatively, rather than competitively. And I know uh, some might see that differently in the business arena. However, imagine the world where everyone wins and wouldn't that be a great world to work towards? It can start with those conversations where we express interest, 
compassionate, open-hearted care towards another human being by inquiring, do you feel as good as you look? And be willing to hear the answer. And your job is never to fix it or change it or make it better for the other person, but certainly we can connect them with services, with people, with strategies, with tools, with things within our community that may very well just provide them their next step. Imagine a world where we all do that for each other. What a wonderful world that would be. Thank you so much for your company today. Um, I know we were going to give the opportunity, we might have space just for one or two questions, but if you put them in the chat, then I have my trusty colleague here on my right, Candice, and she's taking good care of the chat box. So if there's a question, uh, we've probably got time just for one question in between. just well, uh, in case there are any coming in. Uh, just another thing on that time stuff about there being 168 hours in the week. You'll never find the time to go to the gym, to meditate, to soak in a bath. You have to make the time. And that means it has to be a priority for you. So don't uh, try and find time to go to the gym. We often talk about time as if it's got elastic sides. But, you know, if you were playing chess, there are 64 squares on the board. You wouldn't say, I just need a few more squares and I could win. And yet that's often what we do with time. If I had more time, I'd go to the gym. If I had more time, you don't have more time. 168 hours, that's it. Every single one of them belongs to you. Divvy them up so that you use them as skillfully as possible. So did we have... Ali wanted to know uh, about watching the recording afterwards, so we're going to make that available. Mm. Oh, good question, Ali. Yes, uh, we have recorded this, so uh, it will be available. Uh, we'll advertise it through our Facebook page, um, but it'll certainly be available for you later on, or you could share it with someone at another time. Thank you so much, everybody, for your company today. It's been really lovely seeing you. And uh, thank you so much for turning up. I hope you'll turn that little question in on yourself. Am I okay? And am I looking after myself? If I keep that those four C's in mind, is there one of those that I might need to do a little bit of work on and maybe give it a little bit more time and attention? And of course, if ever we can be of service to you or those you love, uh, please pick up the phone and chat with us. We would love to do whatever we can to be of some assistance, some small service to you. And you're very welcome to join me on a Monday evening at half past seven at the Patria King Meditation Group. There's about six and a half thousand people in that group who access it at different times. So that's pretty much every Monday night at half past seven, unless I've got a board meeting, I'm there. And then on Wednesdays between 11 and 11.30, we have a, a session with one of our facilitators and on the first Sunday of the month. And then of course, there are lots of books and CDs and other resources that you're welcome uh, to have a look on our website if any of those might be of some benefit to you. And I really wish you well. I really uh, hope that something today has resonated for you and that you can turn that inner spotlight in on yourself as you do for other people. Thanks so much for your company. And I look forward to being with you again before too long, hopefully before next Are You OK Day. Bye for now. <laughs>